Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to uh, today uh, see a demonstration of the sea level rise data platform for the Gulf of Mexico Alliance habitat and resilience teams that the Nature Conservancy has put together for us. Uh, we have uh, presenting today uh, Dr. Jorge Brenner of the Nature Conservancy and also Jonathan Sheets, uh, who is uh, the key person putting together the platform working with Dr. Brenner. So uh, what we'll do is we'll have uh, two different sections where they'll talk about the project and the data platform, and then uh, we'll have uh, an opportunity for questions, and then we will move on to an online demonstration of the tool. So with that, I'll turn it over to our Nature Conservancy uh, experts. Thank you, Mike. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Jorge Brenner with Nature Conservancy. I'm uh, the Associate Director of Marine Science, and I, for the past year and, uh, and a few more months, I've been managing this project to finalize it and deliver it to uh, the Gulf of Mexico Alliance and the Habitat and uh, Restoration Team of the Alliance. Today with me is going to be presenting Jonathan Sheets, who is our Coastal and Marine GIS Analyst, and he's the author of the data platform that I'm going to be showing today, and uh, he's going to be giving you a live demo and walking you uh, in your screen. You're going to see how he uh, accesses this, uh, the information that we're providing through the data platform. So basically, uh, I'll, I'll just talk for 10 minutes about the project management, the introduction, and basically some of the highlights that we think were of this project and the lessons that we learned. And then Jonathan is going to take most of the time of this presentation to talk about the data platform and the conservation, including the conservation analysis that we built after uh, running the uh, sea level rise and storm surge models. And then finally, each of us is going to spend five to ten minutes showing you how to use the uh, two online components of the data platform. One is where we posted most of the SLAM sea level rise results and the uh, Gulf Resilience Decision Support Tool that the, T the Nature Conservancy began developing last year in which we are posting the, uh, the rest of the analysis, including the SLAM, the storm surge, and also the conservation analysis. So to begin with, um, this is the Gulf of Mexico Sea Level Rise Data Platform Project. We began this project three years ago and just completed by December this year, and we are just wrapping up all the reports and deliverables to, uh, to HCRT and the Gulf of Mexico Foundation in the upcoming week. The goal of this project is really to develop a process to link the understanding of localized risks to the environment and to human communities that might result from sea level rise and storm surge and other coastal threats with opportunities for conservation and community resilience. The goal of the data platform is really to provide the Gulf of Mexico Alliance members, but also the scientific community, the local managers, and communities with an easy access to information for their planning and restoration actions. This slide is really what tells what everything we did in this project. Um, this is what I call the Joint Sea Level Rise Assessment Project, in which we include the sites that we model and, and, and assess for uh, HCRT, but also for the CCRT, which is the Coastal Community and Resilience Community Resilience Team of the Alliance, in which each of these two teams uh, support us with funding to run the models, the SLAM models and the Sea Level Rise models, and the conservation analysis to better inform management actions in, in these sites. But also the data platform really in encapsulates uh, results from the models, but also from other data sets that we uh, included in the, in the geodatabases that will provide good context for managers uh, trying to uh, use these tools to, to come up with an uh, interesting uh, decision-making process. But also the conservation analysis that we used, uh, that, we, that we took all this data and performed to inform how uh, marshes uh, will be able to uh, persist over time and how that informs some conservation opportunities for that in the future using some existing uh, conservation and management uh, policy and actions. And then finally, uh, most of these databases is an offline database that will be delivered, as I said, uh, very soon to the, uh, the, the habitat and uh, restoration team and, and, and in, in the upcoming year to the uh, coastal resiliency team. But also we have two online components, two web pages in which we've been posting some of these results for people to use it freely. I mean, and start using it as in, the, in, their, in, in their own projects and in their own uh, needs. My next slide is really just about the contribution that I think this project also brings in terms of uh, covering some of the Gulf Coast with these models. Those uh, kind of pink uh, uh, 
polygons are our study sites, including in, uh, starting with Texas, with our, uh, Galveston Bay and, and southern Jefferson County area, covering uh, a good part of the northern uh, Texas coast. Also, uh, Grand Bay near that's more a um, um, more uh, uh, small, uh, that's a smaller site that we that, that we model and we develop good projects for uh, products for for the management of the of the near. And then this this huge mega site that encompasses the entire uh, most of the watershed of Choctahatchee and, and St. Andrews Bays in the pan, in the Florida Panhandle. The other kind of more red polygons are what uh, the Nature Conservancy in Florida is doing with uh, funding from uh, an EPA project that they are also helping us uh, contribute to some, uh, filling some of these gaps. And then finally, the, the, the inset, the, the image in the, in the center, it's uh, Jim Paul, chair of the uh, HCRT team, uh, gap, and, and Christian, uh, gap, gap analysis uh, that they've been doing, including all of these sites where we can see, I mean, that with all these projects now, we are co we're beginning to have a good coverage of the Gulf Coast. This project was really a team effort uh, of many, many people. Uh, beginning with uh, our HCRT and CCRT coordinators and chairs uh, and the Nature Conservancy team. As I said, I became project manager almost, I mean, a little bit more than a year ago uh, with the Nature Conservancy for this project, and I was committed to finalize it. Jonathan Sheets came on board in the summer to, to develop the, uh, encapsulate everything into the data platform and became our GIS analyst. But also many other people like Zach and Ben in our uh, goal, uh, global marine team uh, that they've been helping us develop the conservation and resiliency analysis together with uh, Sean. Denise, our grant specialist, some of you had the opportunity to work with her. And then several consultants who helped us develop, for example, Warren Pinnacle Island Modeling. Uh, we added uh, also uh, Image Matters who uh, helped us publish the data in Island View. Arcadis who helped us develop the storm surge models using the uh, hydrodynamic model at CERC. I'm gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, and also some volunteers who help us from uh, designing the web page and the user interface that you're going to see also in, in a few more minutes. Our basic workflow, the way I divided it, it's in three main phases, three main steps. One is the assessment part, all the inundation assessment, including the sea level rise through this land modeling and the storm surge assessment using the ADCIRC, the, the advanced circulation model. Uh, for which we develop a scenarios using uh, from uh, initial conditions to 2025, 2050, 2075, and 2100, and then also for different time slices, uh, I mean, for different inundation levels that goes from 0.39 centimeters all the way to two meters. And most of you are familiar with this, at least these land models and the actual uh, results you are, you, you are gonna see that, uh, from Jonathan today, what, what we did in that end. The, the part in the middle is really the, the analysis that we perform in-house and also with uh, other members of the team, what we call the conservation and resiliency analysis, in which we identify some targets, mostly marshes and ma pa patches of marshes in these different areas for which we develop different uh, indicators of resiliency and conservation priorities in the area depending on the, the, the actual management uh, uh, map in, the, in those areas and how that will be affected by Losing some land to be, to, that will be turned into open water, for example, or, and also other conservation and resilience analysis that Jonathan is going to show you today. And then finally, encapsulating all this into the offline data platform, which is that all those 60 gigabytes of data, that, including the, uh, the context data, the result from the models, the analysis, everything we've done that is going to be delivered in external hard drives to the members of the Alliance, and also what we are posting online due, through the two uh, online components. And this was an inter inter interactive process in which we went back and forth in different stages of this project to develop the best products that we were going to show you today. Some of the project highlights that I think are, uh, were something that we found of value of this project, uh, we'll see if you think also that this is something that you're interested in, is that we think this project was a follow a multidisciplinary goal, approach, and, and, and team of people working and, and putting to work their best skills in, in developing the, pro the best products that we could, as I said. Also, we used the best available models and data for the kind of project that we were developing. This project wasn't really about developing a new project, but we, we using some of the models that we knew that they would give us at least a, a very initial good step on uh, understanding the threats of, of sea level rise and storm surge. We uh, developed this comprehensive sea level rise data platform that you are going to see today. Jonathan is going to show you more about it now. Uh, as I said, it's a 
it's more than 60 gigabytes because we actually duplicated data to provide it in different formats for different audiences and, and, and user types. Uh, we think that we were able to develop a user-friendly interface that, again, Jonathan is going to show you, that we call the, uh, the graphical user interface for people to be able to discover and access the data, the results, the, uh, the snapshots, and also the, the final report, the PDF report for each of these uh, analyses. So we try also to develop a, a variety of different products for different audiences and users. For example, one of not most of our products, although most of our products are GIS-oriented, uh, GIS layers, we also went ahead and created a good amount of uh, GeoPDF maps that anybody can open in their Adobe Reader or a PDF Reader, but also they can download a plugin to make those maps kind of turn into a GIS map where you can do measurements and uh, turn on and off things uh, with a free plugin to be downloaded, and that's explained in one of our reports. Also, we try to provide as many access points or, 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 or strategic access points to the data, as I said, uh, through these online uh, uh, components of the data platform that included the SLAM view, who highly specializes in, uh, in providing SLAM results uh, to be compared side by side, the Gulf res Restoration and Resiliency Decision Support Tool of the Nature Conservancy that also has a good amount of data that uh, this project will benefit from, and also we pass all of our results for the two major models efforts, the storm search and the sea level rise, to the GOMA, to the new GOMA portal that is taking uh, GOMAPortal.org for them to, for, for a larger audience to, to access results from this project. Some of the challenges that we went through this project, as uh, many of you know what they were, and uh, we wanted to, to, to be clear and upfront that we, we also uh, understood that there were many different times in, in this project with changes in management, also with the uh, uncertainties, uncertainties provided by the models that we use. We tried to do our best job in addressing all of these issues, but it comes to a time that we really needed to do what we, have with what we had, so using the data that was available, sometimes it wasn't the best data available, but we tried to use as much and as the most comprehensive database in all parts of this project. And also, I mean, one of the latest challenges really was in the last few months was to pack everything into the offline data platform and also the online components of the data platform. Uh, those were mostly challenges that we were able to overcome, and uh, we were happy that, I mean, everything is turning into a nice uh, product that we hope that the uh, Alliance more, uh, members are going to be using. We are currently working on, as, as, as of today, in completing the final report. Each individual report for each of the analysis we did is finalized. We have PDFs. Uh, most of you have seen most of them, perhaps not the conservation analysis reports, but they are all available and, and finalized, and we are just putting together that into the final management report that I'm working on, and that's going to be ready in the next few days. Also, uh, in, Bilo in the Biloxi meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago, we said we offered to have an online WebEx training. This is what we're doing today here, and uh, we're also offering to do it again at the All Hands meeting in Corpus Christi by June this year, if uh, HCRT is interested. It seems that CCRT will be interested also in that. For our CCRT uh, project part, uh, we are still working on developing the conservation analysis for that huge mega site in Choctahatch and St. Andrews Bay. That's going to take, take us a couple of more months or, or around that time, but also developing more flyers for that part of the project and also talking to Storm Smart Coast and, and Connect uh, web portals that they are helping us uh, potentially, I mean, pretty soon uh, publish uh, the user interface and the reports in, in a web page uh, in, in through their portal. So we're working with them on that, and uh, we'll keep you posted on that issue. So for the Corpus Christi meeting, uh, the All Hands meeting of the Alliance, we really like to also show, be able to show this project again if you think it's a good idea, and we want to come with uh, some of the deliverables and uh, specific products developed by this project, and also if people is interested to be able to provide live demos uh, on site. Uh, but uh, as I said, I mean, uh, we will need to hear from, from you if you guys are interested in us doing this in, in Corpus Christi, in the next meeting in Corpus Christi. We are also working in other related projects. These are TNC projects who are, we are working with other partners uh, that they uh, will also use this information or add new information, piece of information to the uh, C-Level Rise data platform in any case uh, by having those products. 
Some of those include ecosystem services, for example, by working with the Natural Capital Project um, in Galveston Bay, in which we're going to be implementing some ecosystem services models uh, to uh, inform decision making as well, uh, but also those uh, pieces, I mean, those scenarios that we're going to be developing and, and management plan, uh, they're going to be normalized by the, the threat of sea level rise and storm surge, for example. Then, well, that, that's basically it for me as per the uh, project management part uh, that I wanted to share with you. What is really next is to look at the real data, the real products, and uh, the way to access those. So I'll pass the, uh, the microphone to Jonathan, who is going to be with you for the next 20 or so minutes, whatever it takes to, to show you uh, the data platform, the GIS component, in ArcGIS, uh, the conservation analysis, the user interface, and uh, then we're going to switch to the online components, uh, the two other tools. Hey, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Jonathan Sheets, the uh, Coastal Marine GIS Analyst with TNC. And I'll be uh, giving you a presentation of the, um, the database. So here's the outline of what I'll be talking about today. I'll give you a brief introduction. I'll discuss some of the products we made. I'll show you the interface. I'll show you the database. And then afterwards, Jorge and I will show you the offline maps, and, or the online tools, sorry. So here's a summary of the products that were made for this project. We have the uh, sea level rise uh, scenarios created by the SLAM model, which can be seen here. We have the storm surge scenarios created by the ad surge model. And then using the results in both these models, we conducted conservation analyses to assess how uh, human communities and marsh habitat would potentially be impacted by both of these climate hazards. So here's kind of the structure of the platform itself. So here in the center, we have the database. And to access the database, we have a series of offline web pages, basically, which are our user interface right here. So um, and then we also have the online tools to show some of the data that we have for the project, which includes slamview.org and also the Gulf of Mexico Restoration and Resiliency, Resilience Decision Support Tool. And then we also have uh, MXD maps created in ArcGIS for GIS users. And then for the non-GIS users, we have PDF files, which are actually GeoPDF files, which are kind of cool because they actually maintain uh, spatial information regarding the maps within the PDF. So I'll show you how to use those later, too. Um, so here's a snapshot of the main page of the user interface. Um, the main purpose of it is just to introduce the project, to describe the study areas, to visualize the products, and also to navigate to uh, certain folders within the database that contain data. And so they're coded in HTML, and they're actually stored locally on your hard drive. So the database itself, um, it's primarily stored in Esri Geo databases, but we also have it, uh, we have another folder containing uh, shapefiles, which we, the main reason for using this is because it's just easier to use shapefiles for most people than Geo databases, so that's, and uh, that's primarily why we did that. And so the archive, so the database is divided into two folders, which consists of the data platform folder, which contains, contains the geo databases, and then the data archive folder, which contains the shape files that I was just talking about. But also the data archive folder contains original data sets for some of the files we use, um, model input data, and then just ancillary files that we were using for the project. So the offline maps, which users can use to view some of the products from, our, uh, from this project, include the MXDs, and then also the GeoPDFs. So here on the bottom, I'll talk about the GeoPDFs first. Uh, it's a snapshot of uh, Adobe Reader, which is free for anyone to use. And so um, if anyone wants to access the spatial information that's saved within it, which makes it a Geo PDF versus a normal PDF, uh, there are two ways to do this. Either you can upgrade to the Adobe, um, oh, what is it? Adobe Pro or Adobe Acrobat Pro, I think. But if you don't want to do that, you can just download a free toolbar for Adobe Reader, which is the free version, and it's called, it's at terragotech.com. It's included in this link. But once you access that toolbar, you can zoom in on a map here within the PDF document, and you can uh, find GPS locations, like lat long coordinates, you can measure distance, and you can actually calculate perimeter and area. So it really adds a lot more functionality to PDFs, which is kind of cool. Um, so then the online tools, which we'll show later, are SLAM view and decision support tool. This is the Gulf of Mexico decision support tool, and uh, they're providing these two links here. So I will switch to a live demo to show you the database and also the user interface. So 
give me one second to exit out of PowerPoint and migrate over. So I must apologize. Uh, my computer speed is a little slow since I'm giving this presentation live. So, all right. So if you go to the actual database itself, which is saved as this SLR underscore project on, uh, I guess, the local hard drive, wherever you'll have it saved, you'll see this folder. You'll see these series of folders. So as I discussed before, there's the data platform folder, which is primarily holds GIS data and geodatabases. There's the data archive folder, which is primarily shapefiles with all ancillary data. And then also a third folder called the interface, which is where the, uh, the offline web pages are shown. And then we also have supplementary files here, um, ArcGIS Explorer, which is a free to download and free to use tool from, ArcGIS, from Esri, which allows people who don't actually have um, a license for ArcGIS to actually view shapefiles and see the products in this uh, in our project. And then we also have a README file just to introduce users to how to use it. So within the interface folder, I'll show you a series of all my web pages we made. So if anyone has ever used um, a website, well, you can op open these pages with your internet browser, is what I'm trying to say. So if you navigate to the HTML document called main page, this is the home page for our offline website. So you double click it, and, sorry, it opened up my second monitor. And it should open up whatever your default browser is, and it'll open up the web page. So for my computer, it's Internet Explorer, but you could also use it in Google Chrome, and Mozilla Firefox. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, computer speed's a little slow. So here's the main page for the project. <coughs> um, it gives a brief introduction, and it also shows uh, a little inset map here of all our project sites. So we have the Florida sites in Chalkahatchee and St. Andrews Bay. We have Grand Bay, which is a little one here, and Galveston Bay and Southern Jefferson County. And so it has contact information along with acknowledgments, et cetera. So um, this works just like a website would online, so it should be very easy for the user to use. But this is stored locally. So if you look over here on the right, we have uh, links to the three project sites. Well, <coughs> we actually combine the two Texas sites into one, and so that's called the Galveston Bay and Jefferson County Texas site here. But if you click on any of these, they'll take you to a new page that describes the actual project site itself. And so here's an inset map of Grand Bay, for example, and then description of it, plus links for more information. So also on the right here, we have the products that we made for each project site. So we have the SLAM sea level rise scenarios, the storm surge scenarios, and the conservation analyses. And then also a link to the GS data platform, which I'll discuss at the end of this. So I'm going to go back and go to Galveston Bay. Once it loads. Here's the Galveston Bay project site, and then I'm going to show you some of the products we made. So I'll click on the sea level rise scenarios, and then you'll see um, the one meter by 2100 scenarios, um, sea level rise maps that we made for Galveston Bay, listed here. So we actually modeled five scenarios of sea level rise by 2100, which is shown on this graph in the top left. We have the one meter, the 1.5 meter, and the two meter as well as the um, A1B mean and A1B maximum scenarios from the IPCC report. So the one we show, the one we decided to show to public is the one that's in the middle of all these five scenarios, which is the, uh, the one meter scenario, and which is also, um, according to the scientific community, the one that's most likely to happen. So these series of maps here show um, how land cover will change, specifically how marshes will migrate inwards as sea level rise raises by one meter by the year 2100 for Galveston Bay. So the first map here at the top is the initial condition in 2004 with all the land cover categories. We switch to here, we have 2025, 2050, 2075, and 2100. And if you scroll down to the bottom, we have the results for Southern Jefferson County, which was actually modeled before this one. And so as you can see um, from the initial condition, the orange is a regularly flooded marsh, and the red is regularly flooded marsh. You can see through uh, the progression through time, by 2100, with one meter of sea level rise, there's a huge transition of marsh from being a regularly flooded to regularly flooded, as well as some areas being inundated by stream water. So these maps are created by Warren Pinnacle, and you can click down here at the bottom to actually go to their website. So I will show you the storm surge scenarios next. 
I scroll to the top of the page. All right, so click on, you go to the storm search scenarios page, you'll see the results of our storm search modeling. So this is for Galveston Bay again, and there's a description of the model. We also, we also have links to uh, the hydrographs produced by the model, so you can view uh, basically sampling points within the data set. And if you click on this link here, it'll open up the Google Earth file. So, I mean, I guess I can open, open up for you real quick just to show you how it works. So if you have Google Earth installed on your computer, it should just open up automatically. So here we are, zooming in to Galveston Bay, and these are the 200 sampling points for um, both the Galveston Bay area and the Southern Jefferson County area that we, that we modeled. So you can click on any one, and it should open up yeah, the hydrograph. So as you can see through time, uh, this, this is modeling Hurricane Ike which hit in 2004, I think. And so they're replicating that, the conditions for that hurricane scenario in 2050 and 2100 um, with one meter of sea level rise. So these are the, so the different color um, lines represent the different scenarios. So I'll go back to the actual maps again and show you, uh, show you what it looked like. So this first map here is initial condition for 2004, and so since this is a hydro, um, hydrographic model, a hydrological model, it's showing the height of the maximum storm surge above sea level. So as you can see here, you can kind of see the rotation of the hurricane as it hit made landfall, and so since hurricanes rotate counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere, that's why the, uh, the eastern part of the Alpha Bay hit higher with the storm surge than the western part. So um, with this scenario, it, we ran it again for um, in 2050, the same storm surge scenario, but it also not only did it raise the sea level rise, the, the sea level by not necessarily one meter, the one meter is by 2100, but I guess maybe about half a meter by 2050. It also used our SLAM land cover data sets as an input layer for this. So it's in a sense the model within a model. So we, we ran the, the storm surge model using the rules of our SLAM model. So it's pretty cool. So I'll go back and I'll show you some of our conservation analyses that we conducted using the results of this data. So if you click on this uh, fourth link down here, a new page that shows you some of the analyses. So um, one of the first analyses that we ran was a land cover change analysis for the land maps. So what this consists of is comparing the initial condition land cover to the land cover in 2100 with one meter of sea level rise to quantify how much each land cover category has changed. So here on the left is the Galveston Bay SLAM uh, land cover analysis, and over here is the Jefferson County one. So as you can see, uh, the units are in acres, so any, and on the left side here each, is each land cover category. So any purple bars represent losses, and any, any green bars represent gains. So for example, if I can zoom the web page and I'll show you. So by 2100, it is predicted that the estuarine water category will gain roughly maybe 60,000 acres with one meter of sea level rise, while uh, undeveloped dry land will lose maybe 65,000 acres, and inland fresh marsh will lose maybe 40,000 acres. And then we'll see a gain of tidal, mar or tidal flats by, I don't know, maybe about 40,000 acres. So that's primarily what this analysis is showing. So as you can see over here from the Jefferson County analysis, it's primarily a transition of one marsh type to another. So it goes from, you see a huge loss of a regularly flooded marsh, but it's transitioning to regularly flooded marsh, um, tidal flats, and estuarine water. So some of the sam here's some samples of some of our other analyses that we conducted. So for Galveston Bay, we looked at the exposure of uh, human populations, which we represented by census block groups, to um, sea level rise and also storm surge. So this map here shows you um, individual block groups that uh, the colors represent the percent of that block group that was exposed to, which one is this? I think this is, this is for actually both sea level rise and storm surge combined. So as you can see, uh, the block groups nearer towards the coast, of course, have a higher percentage of exposure. So they're from 76 to 100%. Um, 
The other analysis we have here are actual community resilience analysis conducted to uh, determine how resilient these human populations are within each block group to these um, to different climatic hazards. So this one here combines the exposure analysis along with the social vulnerability index to determine which populations or which census block groups are highly vulnerable to begin with just based on socioeconomic factors that are also that will also be exposed to uh, sea level rise and <coughs> storm surge. And so that's what that is showing. And then down here at the bo bottom, here's an example of our um, analysis for assessing marsh have, uh, marsh locations in 2100 with one meter sea level rise and if there will be if they fall within current conservation boundaries. So um, in this graph here, uh, the green and red represent all marsh locations in 2100, but the two colors represent if they fall within a um, current conservation boundary. So all green areas represent marshes that will either persist from present day locations to 2100 or will gain new area by 2100 with one meter sea level rise and that are also protected currently, while the red shows the same marshes that will persist or gain new area, but that are not protected at the, uh, currently with present-day boundaries for conservation areas. So those are, yep, those are our samples of our conservation analyses. And so the next thing I'll show within the user interface is just the, um, the GIS data platform page, or the data download page. Just give me one second to navigate to it. Okay, so this page itself is the easiest way for the user to access data within the database. I mean, if they don't have our catalog or other GIS software to ac actually access the, um, the shape files. So the way it's divided is that, um, I guess I should talk about the structure of the database first so you can understand. So the database itself is divided into the data that we produced for each project site, which, which are represented by these three sites here on the page, but also data that we downloaded from other sources that represent Gulf-wide data sets. And so since we have such a large inventory of Gulf-wide data sets, we organize them into themes or thematic layers. So within the database, we have folders representing these themes. So all human-related GIS data sets are saved within the human folder. Same for habitat, uh, boundary files, environmental, oceanographic, and then climat climatic hazard data sets. Um, and also, we conducted conservation analyses at the Gulf White scale as well, which is not really shown within the user interface itself because in the, the user interface we're focused on the project sites, but within our project, within our final report, you'll see the results for that. And so that's what's uh, shown here. So to access the data for each one of these, you go over here to these links on the right, and it'll either take you to the data platform folder, as I said, holds the databases, or the data archive folder, which holds the shape files. But also we have a third link here in the middle for actual MXD. So if the user has GI software, they can click on this link and it will actually open up the MXD file, which is kind of cool. So you can click on it if you wanted to. I won't do it now because I'm sure RGIS will take a lot of load, but you can just click open and it'll open in the, it'll open RGIS with the, lay, the, the data saved in a, a format that the GIS users can use. Um, and so I'll show you how these other links work too. So if we want to look, if you are interested in climactic data, climactic hazard data sets for the Gulf, you can click on the data archive folder, which will take you to the shape files for those. You click on it, and it actually opens up Windows Explorer here and gives you all the, the individual files themselves. But here again, since we're using inter, uh, Internet Explorer, um, Windows Explorer, and it's, Windows Explorer is not designed to actually use GIS software, you'll see the files like this. But you can easily ca copy all the files from one location to another one. All right, so I guess the next thing I can do is I'll exit the user interface, and then I will move towards the uh, GIS data set, um, the actual database itself, which I have here. Um, it's probably best to show you an art catalog. So I'll show you an art catalog. It's a sampling that's in the data sets that we collected, along with that supplement our uh, the, the, the data that we produced for this project. So here's our catalog, which is created by um, the ESRI. It's part of the um, ARC GIS suite of GIS software suite. And so if you click on it, 
and go to data platform, for example, I'll open up the geo database so you can see similar data. So for example, I'll show you the climactic hazards one. You scroll through here, you'll see the actual geo database itself containing all GIS data for climactic hazards. And it's subdivided into feature data sets by climactic hazard types. So for floods, we have all the FEMA flood risk maps for the Gulf that were currently available. We downloaded the we we acquired these uh, I think in November, so that's how recent they are. And they're divided divided by state. We also have historical hurricane track data since um, since 2000 or 2000 2008 is the, the range for it. We also have sea level rise scenarios. Um, and actually, I can show you these in our GS in our catalog as well, if it will cooperate with me, which I don't think it will. As you can see, I can't see my mouse after it goes <laughs> goes over. So I'm sorry, I can't show you that. Um, and besides climactic hazard data, we have uh, habitat data. We actually, let me show you the environmental data first. You in the environmental data, we have all uh, ge geologic data sets for all states. We have n the most recent national wildlife inventory data for all states. We have uh, soils by county. We also have stream networks and watersheds. And as well, we also have, um, for habitat data, we have uh, a whole host of GIS data sets for different habitat types which are shown here. So, and it's organized by species types. So annelid reefs, beaches, cold seeds, coral reef data, um, marine species, mangroves, marshes, oysters, etc. So th that's the sampling of the data we have in our database. So now I will transition to the, um, I'll show you the online tools which we're using to show our data to the public which consists of the SLANview website and uh, the Gulf Decision Support Tool. So I will switch it to Jorge now, so he'll show you this land view website. Okay. So now it's my turn to show you how um, this land view works. Um, for some, perhaps some of you have already used this tool, especially because uh, it seems that Image Matters, the company who developed the tool, was supported by uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to do uh, to do this and. Um, They've, they, they've done a great work in posting uh, most of everybody's slam data here online. So we have done that as well, and I'm having troubles to, there it is, there is Maximize. So if you go to slamview.org, um, you will find this window that will give you this quick mode that takes you to a map, but it's not, it's, it's probably not the best way to access the data. Probably if you want to see everything right now, I'll go to the interactive mode. Once it opens, you will see that there is a list that is a collection of all SLAM results and reports being posted in this uh, portal, including ours. So, um, for example, we have here uh, Galveston Bay, Grand Bay National Estuary Research Reserve, Jefferson County, Texas side here, and then if you go all the way to the bottom, we should be able to see Choctahatchee and St. Andrews. I don't know what's happening with the mouse, and I just can go go down. So I'll just show you the Galveston Bay side again. So what you get by clicking here, it's selecting Galveston Bay. Here you can see that it's been selected as your main project site. You will see uh, that in this particular case, uh, uh, some data or metadata, basic metadata about the project. For example, that the cell size for this model was 10 meters. The base year was 2004. It was modeled by Jonathan Cloud with Warren Pinnacle for us under this project. And I'm the contact, the contact person for, for any comments and questions. And very important, if you could click here, you can download the uh, PDF report that uh, Warren Pinnacle helped us develop for this project site. So once you select Galveston May, really what you need to do is go to here to scenarios and select which scenario you would like to see side by side. So I'll choose just the one meter inundation and for the years I'm going to select the base scenario and 2100 and then I'm going to click here compare. So side by side the uh, slam view tool is going to show me uh, the base map and the 2100 um, scenario for Galveston Bay. I can zoom to a particular area. It does the same thing in both, uh, both windows. Those blue polygons um, 
uh, like void or hollow polygons that you see there are management areas that its land view uh, tool automatically adds to the to the uh, to the viewer um, whether they are fish and wildlife service or other uh, management areas mostly you use fish and wildlife service parks and, and refuges if you want to see the legend these are the, uh, as you know, uh, SLAM uses uh, NWI, National Wetland Inventory Classes. Uh, so these are the, the equivalent of NWI classes that our SLAM results are, 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 are reported on. So we can see the, um, the changes in uh, undeveloped dry land and uh, things that become, uh, and those uh, tidal fresh marshes and uh, regular flooded marshes that become open water really by 21 uh, hundred uh, scenario in Galveston Bay Island. This is just an example t to show you what we can do uh, with SLAM view and uh, one of the main reasons that to, um, to publish information here is really because it, the SLAM view has become, as you can see, I mean the one-stop repository of the SLAM model results uh, and so we thought it was a great idea that our results will be here together with many others. So people kind of start looking at how to uh, understand larger areas uh, by uh, looking at different models results. Uh, Jonathan is going to show you right now um, the, uh, the restoration and resiliency the decision support tool that the Nature Conservancy has developed in last year in which we also published these results together with the results from the conservation analysis and the storm storage. So you can actually look at this results from two di in two different uh, web portals visually as well as you can download it from uh, uh, gomaportal.org uh, in the upcoming week. It's, uh, I just talked to uh, the data manager for that tool and uh, it will take them a couple of weeks just to, uh, to finalize up uploading all of our results. Okay, I will show you the, des the decision support tool now. I will just show you Hopefully, just give me a second to have it get up and running. There is a little bit of a lag here. So. Uh, right, this might not be. I'm sorry, I'm experiencing technical problems at the moment. <laughs> so I'm trying to drag, drag the legend over. This might not be doable. Okay, so as you can see, when you open the tool, it zooms into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and here at the top, on the left side of the screen, we have the map layers. We can view individual shape files that are uploaded to the online server to show you. But we also have two tools called the Restoration Dashboard and the Habitats and Hazards Dashboard. So if the user clicks on the Habitats and Hazards Dashboard, it'll get into more specific data that's from our project. So it's organized into marsh migration files, which are results in the SLAM, and also flood scenarios files, and then also ecosystem services, which are data sets, but not from this project. So I'll show you um, the marsh migration file. You'll see uh, some of our project sites. So I'll click on Grand Bay, and you can see the SLAM sites again. This is just a way to view it, another website to view it. So once you click on that, there's a new tab pops up that says scenarios, and then you'll see all the different scenarios we can show. So I'll just show you the Grand Bay, Grand Bay near Slant near 2100. So that's what's shown here. And also included with this, we have uh, some analyses as well, gains and losses marsh, uh, maps. So as you can see here in green, uh, this is showing a regularly flooded marsh. And so green is areas where it will gain by 2100, and red are areas where it will be lost from its location and uh, the initial condition. So besides the, the marsh migration files, we also have uh, flood scenarios, which show some of our storm surge data, as well as um, the locations that will be inundated by sea level rise based on the SLAM model. So this time we'll move to Galveston Bay, which is another project site that we have. And then the scenarios tab will open, and then you can access individual files. So I'll click on one called locations that will be uh, what is this called? I'm sorry. Uh, entering water gains by 2100. So this map shows you 
area. According to the SLAM model, which areas will be directly inundated by upstream water? So as you can see, um, most of downtown Galveston will be spared, but as you can see down here in the West, in West Bay, a lot of the marsh areas will be inundated, as well as over here in the East Bay section. So we have scenarios for this for all of our project sites, which can be accessed under this Habitat and Hazards tool. To access, some, to access the uh, conservation analysis results that we have, you have to go to the map layers over here on the left, navigate to the Texas folder, and um, go to uh, which, here it is, the Galveston Bay Resiliency Analysis, sorry. So within this, you can see the results in more detail of our conservation analysis results. So this is the same thing I showed you in the previous tool. So, for example, this one I clicked on is storm surge exposure to Hurricane Ike. Uh, the next one is hurt, um, storm surge plus sea level rise. We also have uh, existing marsh management, as well as other ones. And let me let this load for a second. So here we go. Um, there. So here again, these are marsh locations by 2100, just like I showed you in the interface, but for, this is actually including Jefferson County. So you can see most of Jefferson County has marsh areas uh, by 2100 that are already protected. So that pretty much sums up this tool. The data is either found in the map layers section over here by state or within the specifically designed habitats and hazards tool at the top by um, data set categories. So flood scenarios, ecosystem services, and marsh migrations. So I think that sums up that tool. I'll switch it to Jorge for the rest of this presentation. Question answered, I guess. Yeah. Well, basically, um, with this uh, with this tool, we we finished what we wanted to show you within a, a limited amount of time. I mean, there is much more to share, uh, especially when it comes to um, when it comes to looking at the uh, the, act, the, the most powerful tool really in the data platform is it's ArcGIS, ArcMap, which is the, the visual tool of ArcGIS software in which we have all the data. And uh, a GOMA user or a scientific partner having access to the data platform, they can just do whatever they want with all the data that we have and expand the number of analysis and the, the, the way of looking at what we already presented here. Uh, we did not show that here today because of the um, time limitation, but they, basically that's where we have 60 gigabytes of data available for anybody to play with and uh, to do, uh, put them to work for their own questions. And that said, that's it for us. Uh, we basically forgot about opening for questions before, after Jonathan finished the live demo. So I guess for the remaining of the time, I mean, please tell us if you have any questions. Well, this, this is Mike, I have one question about the the inundation modeling that you showed when you went into the hydrographs of, of one of the sampling points of Galveston Bay I noticed that there was a you had uh, future scenarios with and without sea level rise and I noticed that the one without sea level rise was you know different from the 2004 line so I'm just wondering uh, what explains that um is, I mean, are, is, are there inputs that are that are projecting uh, erosion and accretion, or how is that? Uh, actually, I I don't know the question to that. I mean, uh, this is probably a question for Arcadis, which were the modelers that we used for this. Um, uh -huh. I know they did run they ran the no sea level rise scenario in 2100 as a test to uh, compare with the results, how the results would be different if the sea level rise didn't change, but how I think the primary reason for this was based on the Land land cover mass. Actually, I'm not really sure. So, <laughs> I'll well, say. okay. My basically uh, the no sea level rise scenario uh, by 2100 is to test uh, the effect of marshes without sea level rise in attenuating uh, the surge. So that's why one of the uh, the reasons we decided to run that that particular scenario to see if there was an effect uh, without uh, by not looking at sea level rise. So by not adding an, on top of the uh, the hurricane or the storm. Uh, the, I mean, the, the, the complexity of having uh, more water, uh, like a higher water level, and just look at the effect of marshes in attenuating uh, that effect of storage. That's why we have that particular additional run. 
So that green line, that particular run, uh, included the marsh migration. It's, it's a different mar marsh regime, I guess, than the yeah. 2004. Is that the difference? Well, what, 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 it's, what it's really telling you there is that uh, if we didn't have any sea level rise, I mean, marshes will, will take some, um, will, uh, will, will provide some buffering capacity to, uh, mini, I mean, to uh, cope with, uh, with the surge as compared to the red line, which is the full 2100 by, by uh, 2100 uh, with sea level rise scenario. So that's your worst case scenario, having one meter by sea level rise by, uh, of sea level rise by 2100, that's the red line. So the green line really tells you that the inundation will be lower uh, if we will have marshes as we have them uh, by, 20, uh, by the initial conditions. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, I guess this is more of a comment. This looks like a lot of really great information. I'm not going to pretend to even remotely understand how to use it all at this point. But um, when you were demoing the user interface, mm -hmm. is, how do you access that information? Is that available on the on a website, or how how do you get that? Because I I think you said that it was then something that you downloaded to your personal mm -hmm. machine, or yeah, well, basically, we we developed that that collection of web pages, that user interface, to be an offline uh, way to access and discover the data once we put it in the external hard drive that we're going to be developing to the alliance. But with the time, that project evolved to that with the with the possibility to become a full web page, online web page. Um, so that's why I mentioned before that we are working with Storm Smart Coast for, with, uh, with, that perhaps with their help in the next few months we'll be able to upload everything online and people will just be able to, to gather everything online. As for now, really what is online, it's just uh, what is an, uh, an Islam view and uh, the restoration and resiliency decision support tool. And this in interface, it's really offline, and it's built into the hard, uh, hard drives and uh, DVDs that we're burning uh, in the next few days. Okay. So we would just get sent those, or you know, and and then that would be a just kind of an as ordered. We could get those, but they would, but they're not going to be online on the website. Not in the next two or three months. I mean, Storm okay. Smart Coast is migrating to a new content manager and cloud system to host all their data because it, it, the project seems to be uh, very successful and uh, mm -hmm. they're just going to undertake that in the next couple of months. So once they finish that migration, they told us that most likely they will give us the, need, the space needed, probably in the order of 100 gigabytes, to be able to post all this information online. And we will definitely keep you posted on that. And my first reaction and understanding is that perhaps this is going to be, this should be ready by the uh, All Hands meeting in June, but mm -hmm. I just cannot promise that. But according for what they said to us, it, it will be a matter of a couple of, two or three months for them to do that. Once it's done, I mean, as you can see, this interface is already built into our uh, HTML code, which mm -hmm. is appropriate uh, for just posting it online right away. Whereas uh, for now, if you are interested in, in getting a copy of the uh, Data platform. Uh, if you can just ship your, ship us your uh, external hard drive, I'll be happy to put this information for you. Okay. Okay. So that's how that's how we would get it. We would just have to get you an external hard drive. Yeah, I'm gonna be the, the, delivering to uh, the Gulf of Mexico Foundation uh, pretty soon two copies of the full data database in two hard drives. So okay. uh, I guess you can either uh, once that's done uh, in the next couple of weeks, uh, I guess you can ask Michael for a copy, or you can just directly ship me your external hard drive, and I'll be happy to do that. Awesome. Thanks. You're welcome. You mentioned that you were doing some type of, I guess, project in conjunction with this or um, a side that complements this about a Gulf-wide sea level rise report. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, um, I'm, uh, I'm working on gathering information on erosion, accretion, and sea level rise trends for different places in the Gulf, especially for Mexico and Cuba, just because, I mean, in working in this project, I realized that there is good data for the United States, especially that uh, Tides and Currents uh, NOAA webpage that provides uh, 
uh, that information for the last 20 years on the trends that of sea level rise, but we don't have anything similar for Cuba and Mexico. So I'm, I'm preparing just like a, like an in-house project in which I'm like a GIS simple uh, map, series of maps of what it's uh, the, what are the trends in other places in Cuba and Mexico. If you are interested on that, I can I mean I can tell you more later if you want. Are you doing something where you take all the information I guess that's been generated through this project and other SLAM modeling and doing a, like a Gulf-wide analysis type report? Well, I'm including, I'm including some of that in my management report that I'm going to be turning in pretty soon. Uh, it's just taking, uh, you know, like the, 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 the most obvious trends and analysis from uh, the data that we already have just to say what we learned from this project. So that's a complete section in, in the report. Um, but um, we haven't done anything like analyzing everybody else's data. But sure. um, I'm glad that you mentioned that because we are in the process of gathering data from the additional SLAN model results that, for example, Jim Paul and Kristen uh, contracted with Warren Pinnacle for five addi additional sites as part of the HCRT uh, uh, series of projects, I guess. And also what the Nature Conservancy in Florida, my colleague Laura Gesselbrack is doing under her uh, EPA uh, grant for uh, five other sites in the Gulf, along the Gulf of Mexico. So we will be collecting that data, and perhaps it will not be all available by the time we deliver this to, um, to uh, Gulf Mexico Foundation as a final report, as part of our contract. But we, we talked to Ryan, and we, we both would like to add this information to the data platform. And once we have all that data, then it will be probably the time for us to do more like a Gulf-wide analysis. Right now, we really have Texas, Mississippi, and those two base systems in Florida which is good data, and as I said, that's part of my report, uh, but it is still kind of limited as compared to the power that it's going to give us once we uh, assimilate to the data, into the data platform. I mean, uh, the additional five sites from Jim and Kristen and, and from Laura Gesselbrack of the Nature Conservancy, that will bring almost 10 more sites right away that will give us the opportunity to have more, uh, you know, sampling sites uh, or, or samples uh, to, to do a, like a more Gulf-wide analysis. We would love to do that, definitely. I guess when you were going through the conservation analysis portion mm -hmm. of the project, um, how did you come up or come up with your conservation targets? Well, basically the targets are marshes and uh, existing management areas. Uh, we have a few other targets for some of these areas. What Jonathan showed here is just a sample, uh, and especially because that's all we posted in the uh, user interface uh, in that web page that Jonathan was explaining. It's just a sample, a snapshot of a few re results. Once you go into the data platform and look into the GIS data, we have a whole folder that says conservation analysis, let's say for, uh, for, G for Grand Veneer. And then we, we, you will find everything we did for Grand Veneer th there, including, for example, looking at the oysters, uh, 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 the impact over oysters populations because Grand Bainier had a specifically uh, an interest in oysters. So that's how we choose uh, the, the targets. We, we went by what stakeholders told us, the data that we had, and very importantly, what SLAM really could help us do, which was mostly dealing with marshes. I guess for the sites that you've, um, that you've looked at, Grand Bay, Jefferson, Galveston, and then the two in Florida, are you now planning to go back to some of the stakeholders that contributed to both the SLAM modeling or the, I guess, providing some information for conservation targets? Are you going to go back to these folks and try to show them the results of this report, or are you just hoping to reach them through the Alliance all hands, or kind of what are your plans for that? I guess both, uh, both of, both of the, what you mentioned. We will definitely uh, – we will definitely reach out to them in the next couple of weeks, sending them, we're preparing like uh, this, uh, you know, like synthesis materials, like a one page document with all the links where to download, for example, the reports. We're gonna provide them for each of these sites, uh, each group for each site, we're gonna provide them with their own reports. 
uh, for the SLAM, for the ad search, uh, some search models, but also the conservation analysis. We have individual conservation analysis reports for each side. Uh, we also have a go-wide conservation analysis report. Uh, we're going to be reaching out to them by email and uh, letting them know where to download the data, or if it's not published online, uh, some of these pieces, we will just send them to them. And then at the old the all hands meeting, really, the idea was to provide specialized uh, or individual uh, online demos to, to those groups to be able to tell them where their data is, what we did, what they, what they told us, uh, what type of products it's, there, it's available for each of them. Well, I know we're getting to the end of our time, and I don't, uh, Jorge, if you, don't you need to get to another call, or do you have more time? I have another call, yes. Yeah, right. okay. Well, then, with that, I think I want to, I just want to thank you uh, both for uh, uh, doing this demo for us and letting us record it for others to view, and thanks for a great product. Thank you so much. And as I said, Mike, I mean, in the next couple of weeks, you're going to hear from me that I'll be coming to your office to deliver all these products and the hard drives and hard copies of the reports, that sort of thing. That's great. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Bye, Thank guys. You. Thanks. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.